What's up, everyone, and welcome into the Buffalo Sports Collective. It is Wednesday, August 14th, 2024. As always, I am PK alongside my co host, Phil, for episode 299. Next week is the big 3 0. I currently have nothing planned for the show. I don't know if you do. Um, maybe we'll just uh, wear a fun party hat and uh, celebrate 300 regular episodes. It's uh, it's kind of crazy. We've done 300 of these. We probably if we would have done two shows all summer the past two summers, we would have reached this a long time ago. But uh, I do enjoy my uh, my long <laughs> six months on six months not even six months off six month break. Uh, but uh, Phil, how, how are you doing on episode 299? I'm good. I'm uh, very tired. I am back to work after about a week and a half off. Um, it's like eight eight of my work days off plus two weekends. So it was a long time, and I wasn't getting like it, it wasn't a very restful vacation. We did a lot of hiking, had the wedding, so it was it was a lot. Um, but going back to work, especially working at 6 a.m. Um, these last just even two days, I'm on my feet most of my shift as well. So just really tired, really, really tired getting back to the, uh, the work grind, uh, waking up at like 5 AM has been killing me again. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's exhausting being back to, to work. So I'm just tired. Other than that, things are going well. That's fair. Yeah. We, uh, celebrated producer Pat's, uh, special day this uh last weekend we uh have we announced to, a special day we haven't announced a special day um a special is official special day is coming at the end of the month that we'll uh talk about then but we uh we did some laser tag at buffalo battlegrounds then we went in to the autobahn we're giving free shout outs here that don't even have to pay us and then uh we uh had a bunch of his friends and uh his loved ones at a fire at uh, our buddy Mike's house, which they surprised. He thought it was, uh, he had no idea what was going to be going on. I just told him to save this day and we'll surprise him. But we took him to ba- Buffalo Battlegrounds, got really hot and sweaty uh, playing because uh, they have no AC in there. And then we played no. a bunch of arcade games. Uh, tried to go to Elmo's for uh, his, his dinner, but that was an hour wait. Uh, boo. Um, thanks for uh, accepting. Uh, <laughs> I won't put him on blast too much. So we went to the Audubon instead, and uh, he seemed to like his food there. And then we surprised him with the fire, and uh, he had no idea what was going on whatsoever. And uh, I like torturing him because he likes knowing what's going on. And the only clue I gave him was don't wear open-toed shoes. And uh, he wasn't sure if that was for me to throw him off or if that was a serious thing. So uh, luckily he wore sneakers. But uh, it was a fun weekend, fun jam-packed weekend. It reminded me a lot of when uh, Michael from The Office doesn't tell them it's a booze cruise and tells them to pack an overnight bag, a ski mask, and a swimsuit. And I liked that all of our friends um, continued to mess with him throughout all of dinner. Uh, We just kind of kept saying random things. I I assume at some point he tuned it all out, not knowing what was actually going to be happening or what the heck we were talking about. But we kept throwing different possibilities at him uh very misleading and it was a good time and even driving we all dri- drove from one place to another place and i know a few of us drove different directions and different ways to make it seem like we were going home and there was nothing else going on and it was fun it was a good good little surprise event for our producer patrick that he does all the behind the scenes stuff like all the graphics that are going to be behind my head this episode but uh yeah, uh, episode 299 is uh, starting up here. You can follow Thunder us on way. Facebook, Instagram. I almost said wrapping up. I was done of a <laughs> real quick episode. might have been the quickest we've ever done. Uh, this probably would have been quicker than some of the reels we've done earlier. But uh, remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at Buffalo Sports Collective and on X and Blue Sky Buffalo Sports Co. Don't forget to follow our channel wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our website at buffalosportscollective.com. You can check out our store on the link tree on all our social media sites or at the top of the website, which I just mentioned, by hitting the shop tab. You can represent our massive company at, uh, right there. PK, BSC, on the go. I don't even know if that shows up on YouTube. I have no idea. I don't remember, and I added this stuff. So uh, look for the time breakdowns in the description of the show. Phil, we finally have some football to talk about. We do. Uh, gross, though. Real gross. It was gross. Uh, 
It's yeah. preseason, though. So who really cares what the score is? You're not really taking a ton of stuff from this besides staying healthy. And for the most part, they did. Uh, there, there was one injury that we'll talk about, but uh, well, the third string quarterback got hurt. He went on IR, so he's going to be gone. So they signed Ben Donucci. I can do that because I am Italian. But uh, yeah, uh, so that was pretty much the only massive injury. Chase Claypool went on the uh, IR, but he's been hurt most of training camp. If he was even going to make the roster to begin with, um, but for the most part, Matt Milano and Von Miller didn't play. They lost thirty-three to six. Phil, what can we take, if anything? from this first preseason game of three besides just staying healthy yeah i mean the bit the biggest thing is it's preseason um don't panic don't freak out but it was rough uh <laughs> there's not too many positives to take from it and i think the big thing is the fact that it's preseason and i'm telling myself that also to pump myself up a little bit because it was ugly Against a rookie quarterback, the defense looked not good. Um, a lot of big chunk plays. Wick McDermott was not happy about. The kick return game looked not good. Um, the offensive line looked not good. Um, it wasn't too much good in this game in general, but it's preseason. There were a few positives. I thought Shakir looked really, really good. Um, seeing just him continue, um, I I just don't know... We play a lot of fantasy football, and we hear the excitement about other teams like wide receiver twos, wide receiver threes, like, oh, this guy's got a lot of hype, a lot of excitement around him, and he's still relatively unknown, and that just that doesn't really exist for Shakir, at least in the fantasy world. So it's hard to, in a weird way, like, I don't know what to expect from him. I don't know what his ceiling is supposed to be. I don't know what he's supposed to be. Um, but it seems like, at least after the preseason game, he could be a really solid wide receiver two on this team. It seems like Samuel could be a very wide, solid wide receiver two on this team. I don't think this team is going to have a wide receiver one this year at all. Coleman looked like a rookie. Um, I don't think there's anything you can really take away from what he did. And Scantling MVS did not look good um, as kind of expected. Um, but I think Shakir is going to be interesting i think him and samuel in that brady scheme of a lot of yards after the catch really quick plays design plays i think he's a player that can thrive in that environment so i think he's going to be good for this team i think this team's gonna be weird without a wide receiver one um but we'll see how they break it all down but even to have two solid wide receiver twos and samuel and seemingly shakir i think that will be a good thing for the offense because even though they're similar in what they do, I think what they do really kind of goes with the Joe Brady offense and what he wants to do. So I think it will be interesting to see, but it was good to see Shakir kind of take up right where he left off at the end of last year, which was really good. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not taking too much from this one. They already said they don't really game plan for this game whatsoever. So, you know, the offense is going to look bad. The defense is going to look bad. Especially, everything looked really bad. I think you pointed out the... The, the positives is Shakir looks good. He looks like a Cole Beasley, but possibly slightly better. And I, I know that's saying a lot because Cole Beasley had some really good seasons here, but I feel like Shakir is better with the ball in his hands. And I think after the catch, I think he can do better than a Cole Beasley, but can he run the same routes and find those open areas that Cole Beasley did that Josh Allen was just peppering him over and over and over for those reliable check down passes, if you want to call those. Uh, the offensive line was really bad. I, I thought Torrance was really, really bad in this one in his sophomore you know, preseason. Uh, one other positive, even though he was not that good in uh, practice on Monday, was Tyler Bass. He went two for two. He is becoming a talking point on X, and I'm going to continue to call it X, even though it's stupid. I would love to just call it Twitter because it was such a better name, but X. He, it's going to be a scary season because I think the games are going to be very close this year based on the offense they're going to have and the more newer defense because, you know, we've talked about it all offseason. They lost a lot of veterans. So I think you were the one that brought it up a few weeks ago, if not a couple months ago, of Tyler Bass is a, a very interesting piece to this team because he needs to come up clutch in those close games, these field goals. And when you're talking about a kicker, you know, how interesting can this be? But 
you know, he, he's got to nail those kicks. And there's no – for anybody out there that's saying, hey, why don't you just go get a different kicker? It'll cost the Bills, I believe, three extra million dollars to not have Tyler Bass on this team. So if he absolutely just stinks it up, I think that's the only way you're going to even bring in some possible competition for him. He's not going anywhere. He is going to be the kicker of the Buffalo Bills this season unless something – crazy happens so kind of get ready to just hope that he is able to fix this kickers go up and down all the time so kickers have bad seasons kickers bounce back it's just the position that it is and I I thought the offense you know six of 17 on third downs majority of that was the second team gained just 200 yards cross midfield two times out of the 11 drives it wasn't good this offense isn't good in this game so I'm not going to take much, if anything, from this. The only positive I really saw was our VP Granger, our Vice President Granger Center. I think he is likely going to get the second team reps at the center position. I know him and Will Clapp were going it back and forth between it. I think he is looking to lock down that backup center behind McGovern. And if he's able to do that as a late, I think he was a fifth round pick. I think that's all you can really ask for from a player that's still in a developmental phase is if he can win that backup center position, I I think it's a successful season for him. Yeah, there were a few positive signs from some players, but, and again, it's preseason first game of preseason. Like there's only so much you can take and, (laughs) um, I thought it was funny that uh, McDermott did absolutely yank Josh Allen right at the one quarter mark, despite the fact that Man, Allen did weird. not want to leave. And he was in the middle of a drive. And I think he wanted, I, I just don't think he was satisfied with his own performance as a, a gamer, a competitor to go out there the way they did. Wasn't very good. I mean, Oh, to three over three to start the day. Um, just not what he wanted. So I I think he just wanted to finish that drive off and see if he could get some actual solid points, maybe a touchdown, but it was just funny to see some of the other, most of the other things starters stayed on the field. It was like only Allen that the second it switched over, like, Nope, you're done. (laughs) Just funny to see. Um, I know something you have your notes and something I had in my notes was the fact that McDermott did go two for two on challenges and, He's been known to be brutal at challenges. They brought in that official that was retired to kind of help him with this. And so far, it seems, I mean, again, preseason, whatever, but that's kind of time you want to be testing your challenge ability is in preseason where they don't matter nearly as much. So to see him go two for two and what he was able to see on the field, I think it's just positive in general. I mean, it's some kind of step forward. He didn't go over two and still look miserable. So a weird thing to uh point out in preseason but i think it was another positive that maybe he's going to get better at challenging plays which would be nice because he's not very good at it as a head coach no no that was the other thing i was going to point out i think i read or i heard that on saturday he won more challenges than he did all last year don't fact check me on that but i'm pretty i think he won i don't know if it was last year the year before he won three all year and he won two in just this preseason yeah. game okay maybe that's what i heard then but yeah it's uh it's in a game of preseason like this there there's not a ton of good so if you're talking about winning two challenges which they did change the rule now so you don't have to win both challenges this year to get your third you just got to win one to get that third so you know, it's uh things are working in sean mcdermott's favor with the uh the challenges this year all right pk i got a quick game for you uh, I know you do not like PFF in general. Um, like grain of salt. They said Matt Milano was terrible, or I, I can't remember who they said was better than Matt Milano. I think they were saying that uh, Dodson last year was playing better than Bernard, maybe. I don't know. The, the, some of their grades don't make any sense. So I, I take them with grains of salt. That's fair. Um, so I have the top five offensive grades from the – preseason game the top five defensive bottom five offense and bottom five defense i'm just gonna look for i know you know one of them so for the offense i'm gonna need three names that you think came out on top and the defense just two names that you think came out on top and then two names in the bottom five offense i'm gonna give you actually three names in the bottom five offense because i know you know one of them and then 
two names in the bottom five defense because those are all names that are wild to me. <laughs> okay, I will preface. I have seen this, but I don't remember looking at it. So the only name I remember, and that's why I put it in my notes, was our VP Granger, I believe was in the top five of good offensive. Yes, he was number two with a 75.6, so very good, solid start for him. I got one there. Yeah, you need two more for offense. Because he only played one quarter but went two for three in passing, Josh Allen is a good. Yeah, he was number five at 67.6. So This is why I hate Also, not good for the offense that one of the top five players, I mean, yeah, he's a quarterback, but, I mean, he only played one quarter and he made it in the top five was dorian williams one of the positive defenses no oh okay uh douglas no oh my god what the hell also he was actually on my list of notes of uh just good to see him out there he did play pretty well um good to see that he's healthy again because they they need him pretty badly so good to see him back on the field but continue. Yeah, just going over the numbers. Uh, Shakir <laughs> went three for twenty-two. Yes, three Shakir was one of the top five offense with a seventy-three. He was number three. You're missing two offensive players. Well, I got my three there, right? So yeah. I, so I the number it. one was Curtis Samuel at seventy-eight, and the other one, interestingly enough, number four uh, was Frank Gore Jr. with a seventy-two point five. Stupid. He went 7 for 21 rushing. His long was 21, so he went 6 for 9. I think it was like, his... Did he have catching? He had 3 for receiving? 19. Wow. This is stupid. I hate this thing. Okay, uh, defense. Uh, I don't think you have no go. defense so far. I have no defense. Um, Wait, Hamlin? what was the first one you said for defense? I said Douglas and Dorian Williams. Yeah, nope, neither of them. Sorry. Uh, Hamlin. No. Nope. Epinesa. Yes, Epinesa was number three at a uh, 69. Carter. <laughs> no. Hardy. Nope. I give up. Who are my? Who are the five? Uh, Balen Specter was number one with a 75.5. Kair Elam was number two with a 71.9. Terrell Bernard was four at a 67.7. And D. Delaney was 67.1, number five. Cool. Okay. All right. Uh, bottom five offense, bottom five defense. Here we go. Okay. We'll go with uh, James Cook. Four for two. Yes. He yeah. was the worst offensive grade with a 45.5. Ray Davis. Oh, wait, no. He was, sorry, he was fifth on this list. He was not the worst. He was, how, flip it. <laughs> he was Ray fifth Davis. of this. Ray Davis? Uh, no. Uh, I already bashed him earlier. Torrance? Yes, Cyrus Torrance was a 41.4, and in this article they said he got a whopping... Wait, let me find it, let me find it. Uh, he received a 1.6 pass block grade out of 100, so solid work from him. That's like really if you impressive. get your name right on a test. Yes, pretty much. He stepped on the there. field and got a 1.6. I got my two there. Who are my other three? Uh, Shane, good old Shane. Was it... I don't know how to say his last name. Buccelli? That's okay. He's on the IR. Buccelli? Yeah, he's on the IR. He was 28.1. You said they need to replace him anyway, and now he's injured. Um, Mike Edwards, not good for the Bills O-line, 31.3. And then our boy MVS with a 43.5, um, and his, his drop pass did not help that. Okay. Bottom three, five defense. I don't know. There, Stevenson. Yes. Nice job. He was a 33.5. I'll go with uh, Lovely. No, these are tough. Uh, Austin Johnson. Yes, he was 36.5. Uh, couch. Yep, he was the worst at 31.5. The other ones, Deshaun Williams, 34.2, and Rondell Bothroyd at 35.8. Rondell, sorry. Nailed it. There you go. There Some you fun go. fun PFF grades. So, basically, uh, a couple of the main starting wide receivers did great. Your boy, VP Granger, did fantastic. Um, Allen was Allen. And then some interesting – I mean, I think Elam – being on that list as one of the better players is interesting and good for his bounce back. Spectre 
looking for that depth role could be interesting. Epinesa, good to see him just doing well. And then the bottom guys, I don't know, James Cook, I know he couldn't find any room pretty much. Torrance is concerning a little bit. Again, preseason, we won't take too much into it. MVS is seemingly just what he is. And then, like you said, they need a new QB3. Which they got with uh, Ben DiNucci. So. Correct. Well, that will wrap this up. They got their next preseason game versus Pittsburgh on Saturday Pilsen. night. I will uh, – it'll be very interesting to see if Sean McDermott throws out the starters again yeah. because he was not happy with the first game. And if you do, it'll be interesting to see if he throws them out in the third game. So it's it's a whole new – with just three preseason games, it, it's it's uncharted territory. Well, I guess it is charter territory because they did it last year, but it's more unknown territory of how these coaches are kind of handling this situation. So we'll have another game to talk about. It's also different for the Bills because right. there's so much turnover. Yeah. Um, I mean, with the offensive Previous coordinator, years, again, yes. we talked about it. I mean, yeah, he was here last year, but it's this time it's his playbook and the wide receivers being pretty new to Allen. So... A lot of turnover on offense, so like you said, like maybe normally if it was the same exact team as last year, you would pretty much not see the starters and just trust them, but I, I could see him wanting to get them out there a little bit more this preseason without getting injured and not being crazy, but just to try to get them on the same page before that game one. Um, it's going to be interesting. Another good point, but yeah, we'll break that game down and talk about the positives and negatives on the next show. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you saw the graphic go behind my head. Remember, we are on YouTube. You can watch our beautiful faces and the fun graphics that are behind my heads and the cool setups we got in the room. So go check I out. I got my us. fun shirt on. Yeah, you get to see the cats playing football on Phil's shirt there. If, the uh, Meowfia. You switch over to YouTube. If you don't want to watch us, uh, don't blame you. You can just listen to us on uh, audio only. But that means Mad Maddie Minute, which is behind me. We were talking about producer Pat. He did this graphic. I just haven't had him switch Delvin Shanahan because I keep hopefully wishing that this segment's going to end. I thought it was going to end a while ago. For those of you who haven't been listening this summer, uh, I've promised my services and offered my services to uh the buffalo bandits to entice mad vince to come back for a three-peat so far i'm cleaning up after his animals this keeps getting longer and longer every week returning his packages getting him food i'm his water boy his gardener his charger boy his light boy or his light guy sorry is i i'm his insult fan i'm his spammer sam and i'm his clearance clarence <laughs> phil this week i'm his birthday brad yes i'm gonna keep these alliterations going <laughs> Planning birthdays and parties is never easy, nor is it fun at times. We just got done doing that this weekend and trying to maneuver people and find times that work for everybody in this busy world where everybody's getting married, has families, has kids, so on and so forth. Trying to find time to set up a an event is very difficult. Don't worry. Matt Vince, I will be your planner. We just planned one, like I said, for Pat's party this weekend. I can plan yours as well. Mad Vince, if you return, I can be your birthday Brad. I like it. I like it. I do, um, I don't know, I like hosting. I like setting up for parties and planning parties. I think it's a good time. I mean, we don't have kids, so I don't know what those parties are like to set up and plan and everything. And what you just did for Pat was not your typical, um, Everybody come on over. Like if like when I do the Halloween party, it's pretty much just I get to have fun decorating with wild Halloween decorations, which I love. And then you guys come over and uh, we have some snacks and some drinking and and have a good time. Those are pretty easy to uh, to plan. But if it's like a, a child birthday um, and we know he has kids, and so if you are planning those for him, that'll be a little bit trickier. Um, and I hope. I hope you have to put yourself in a clown suit and entertain for a while. Yeah, at this point, I'm almost wondering if I am hoping that Matt Vince just retires so I don't have to do all these things because these are legally binding. But as as a, I hope he does listen to this and just calls you out at like when he finally comes back and he's like, all right, I am ready to call upon all of these and just I, uh, 
really makes you go through with it. It's going to be interesting gonna, for you and your job. <laughs> I'm going to get a contract in the mail sent to my house that just says, uh, yeah, you have to sign here or we're taking you to court. And then I'm going to yeah. cancel. Or, or he, he will let everyone know that if this does not go through, he will not be playing for the Bandits this season, and it's your fault. I'm going to have to move to Toronto. Maybe they'll protect me because I was the one that uh, <laughs> got Mad Vince to finally retire. But, Phil, before we move on to our final segment of uh, – becoming the Buffalo Bandits owners for 24 hours. Let's dive into our first sponsor of the show, Tap That Tap Room. Tap That Tap Room is at 363 Delaware Street in Tonawanda, New York. They are Buffalo's first women-owned self-pour bar. For our new listeners, a self-pour bar is one that features, this one specifically has 30 consistently rotating taps. You get a mug, you go up there, and you pour it yourself as little or as much of as many of the 30 rotating taps that you would like to try. They offer a variety of beer, cider, sour, seltzers, and malt beverages. It's a lot of things, and what also is a lot of things, they got a busy schedule coming up. Wednesdays and Thursdays are always the same every week. For those of you who have been listening, you already know, but for those that are new, like Phil just mentioned, you might not know. This is the time to get out your calendar. Wednesday. The 14th, Geeks Who Drink Trivia goes on at 7.30. And then the following night, Thursday at 7 p.m., is karaoke. Both of those events happen every single week at Tap That Tap Room. And Saturday the 17th, Phil, it's busy. Yeah, I don't know. They, they, they feel like they're doing what I had to do on Saturday, was maneuvering pieces and having everything form perfectly. 12 p.m. is the Brat Drag Brunch. 12 p.m. starts well, you can get in at 12 p.m. It's $5 cover. Show begins at 1. Brunch food on the menu, including pancake tacos. Those sound absolutely delicious. At 4 p.m., it's paint night with Mary. And then at 7 p.m., live music with Groovy Boys. I did pronounce that right because it's a capital V, G-R-O-O, capital V-E, bros. So, Phil, uh, it's a jam-packed week and especially jam pack saturday at tap that tap room make sure you head down there for any other events check out their facebook page or to see what's on tap and what's on deck check out tap that tap room.com phil um i decided to we got exactly one month until toronto uh tough mutter is up so that's why i wore this one but pretend like we're wearing suits okay today i've worn a suit becoming, too often recently I've worn way too many suits this summer, and I just wore one last show. I think I should have just saved it for this one. But for the next uh, two more weeks now, because uh, they pushed free agency to the 29th and still haven't gotten any words, hopefully they don't push it another time because I don't want to keep getting creative here. We're going to be putting on different outfits. This time, well, I should say next week, we're becoming the commissioner for a day. And then this week, we are the owner slash president of the Buffalo Bandits. So, again, Pretend we're wearing a suit. We're going to be tossing out ideas to try to improve the Bandits as a whole. This is not us tinkering with the roster. This is not us tinkering with the coaching staff. This is not us tinkering with any of the on-field product. This is this is a team aspect. This could be improving the in-game experience, the social media, the the experience for the fans at game day, the halftime entertainment, so on and so forth. This is us just trying to improve the actual product itself because the product on the field has been doing their part. So I'll kick this one off first because I know you got two ideas. I've got three, and then we our listeners tossed in three as well. So I added a couple. Okay, perfect. E- even better. So I'll toss out my first one here because this one – this one has been annoying not just me, but a lot of people. And I know a lot of people at Sabres games will also agree. So maybe we can, as Buffalo Bandits owners here, maybe we can extend this to the Buffalo Sabres. Because we bought the Buffalo Bandits. We do not own or have any to do anything to do with the Buffalo Sabres. Don't put that evil on us, Ricky Bobby. The in arena music and the sound volume needs to be turned down during pregame. The noise before the games is at level 150, Phil, when it only needs to be at, like, 40. I'm not asking for silence. I'm not asking for just tone down, and especially when the players are on the field. I get it. You can turn it up a little bit extra, but it, 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 it shouldn't be where I have to scream to Brooke, who's literally sitting right next to me, for her to be able to hear me. I shouldn't be losing my voice before the game even before the players even go out there for the opening warm-ups it, it, this has been a common complaint amongst fans 
maybe with the new scoreboard going in and the new sound system that's planning to be updated in there, maybe that'll be addressed. But I don't know who's controlling that. Maybe we can send letters. I don't know. But just instead of just going like this, just go like this. It doesn't have to be so extreme. It's it's real loud in there at times, and it's got to be brought down just a tad. Just a tad. I'm not asking for a lot. Just I don't want to be screaming my head off just to talk to somebody that's next to me. Yeah, even the, the intro video is usually just like mime. Oh. It's just so loud. So loud. I mean, my brother and I usually same same thing as you and Brooke are right next to each other. And we'll we'll just look at each other when the intro video goes on. We're like, what? <laughs> you can't you can't hear anything um, with the person literally right next to you. Like you said, maybe the new scoreboard, which I'm very excited to to see what that's about. Maybe the volume and new sound system will uh, change with that. The only thing I can think of with the pregame is that. Because we really don't know what it sounds like on the floor um, during the game. And maybe the players ask for it to be louder so they can hear it better while it's they're the warming same up. It's the situation with the Sabres games, too, though. So it oh, would have to be true. both teams doing it. It's just Well, it's... they could both. Because I, I, I feel like it's harder to hear when you're on the floor. And maybe they want to hear the music when they're warming up to get like pumped up and stuff. And that's why they had to crank it so loud. But... Either way, I'm sure they're also in their own little world and wouldn't care at all if you turn it down and not blast the fans out of just the building. Notch. Just a notch. Right, yeah, it's very loud. Um, my big one, and it's been my main one for a while, and I would have preferred, uh, I don't know, let's see what the new scoreboard's like. I don't think I would have preferred it over the new scoreboard because it sounds like it could be fun. But um, the green floor, I hate it a lot. Um, they've done some nice things throughout the building. I know like seats are a big thing and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of upgrades that need to happen, but the green floor just really, it's just so upsetting. Um, it's gross. It looks like a football, like plays are being, are happening on it or basketball plays, neither of which are played at the arena. Um, it makes no sense. It looks terrible. And I know paint is expensive, but it seems like out of the things you could do for that arena, probably one of the cheaper options to just give it a... I don't even care if it's great. I don't care if you just make it cement, like just get rid of the green that is bleeding through and cracked and terrible and just walking around that arena and just looking down. It's just, it's gross. It's just, it makes no sense to anyone who plays there. It's really old. It's really outdated. It's cracked all over the place. It just it looks stupid. Um, I don't like it. I don't like the green floor at all. So I got third thing. First, uh, we're behind my head now. I forgot to switch Hey-o. over. So again, YouTube. Uh, that's the graphic that Pat made there. Uh, it's just our face on. Uh, we're, we're the owners of the Buffalo Bandits today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, two. Uh, I know that there are a lot of upgrades planned for the arena. So. This might be something that's already in the works. I hope so. Uh, I know the seats are a big talking point. I know there's a bunch of other talking points, maybe widening some of the um, atrium. I know there's a lot of talks for upgrading the arena at one at now that they have the stadium being built in Orchard Park. But three, this isn't just a new thing that Phil's just brought up to his attention. This this man right below me, and he's probably next to me on one of the YouTubes because this gets reordered. He's below me on this this recording. He has been arguing and complaining and fighting against this green floor for years on end. And I fully support him because it's the stupidest thing they ever put in that arena. And I think it's the same paint job that they did when the thing was built in 96. It made no sense back then. Makes no sense now. Paint is cheap. All you had to do when it's downtime, like it is now, when there's not exactly. much stuff going on. Maybe they're doing it, Phil. Maybe they they were they heard this, and maybe they've heard our complaints many times that they bought some paint, just threw it down, and are painting over that thing, and it's just going to be great. Maybe we'll be surprised when we go in. I doubt it, but maybe. But I fully agree with you. It was the stupidest thing from that then and on. I don't know what color to make it. Maybe there was some thoughts behind it from people who I don't know what they were. It. Like, I don't know, close to 30 years ago now. But it was a very stupid thing then. It's a very stupid thing now. And hopefully that is on the list of things that they need to accomplish. My second one here, and this is more 
of an idea. I don't know how possible it is based on money that would cost to do it by paying people to work security earlier. But my idea is to let people into the arena two hours before game time, even if that means you're not allowing them in their seats until 60 to 90 minutes before the game. So it doesn't cost much to just buy those little retractable rope things. You can just have the ushers when they leave for the day, just put those on there. And then when they come to, to be their ushering themselves, they just open that up and then people can go to their seats. But I think if you open it two hours before game time and just allow people to walk around the, the atrium, you can, like I already mentioned, you can block off seats before until the ushers get there. So you're not actually paying the ushers more to get there. You're just paying security to work the, the gates to get there earlier. But it would allow more sales and concessions. It would allow more sales and merch. It would cut down on the lines to get into the arena because that's a main, main thing is, you know, once the doors open, you're getting that first rush and then you're getting another rush. So yes, you're still going to get that initial rush, but maybe now that you have an extra half an hour to an hour, once the doors open, it'll cut down that bottleneck and get people into the game earlier now that they know okay i can get there two hours early i can go to the merch store and and for those new fans out there they want to go to a game and maybe shop around first but they also want to see warm-ups you're allowing that extra time as well so that's my thought is give two hours to get into the game and maybe 60 to 90 minutes to get to your seat so you're still blocking it off you're not paying the ushers more but you are paying security an extra half an hour more to get in there and get people through their seats well get into the arena yeah i think when the arena was created and this is absolutely something they cannot change um because of the structure of the building but the ticket area is brutal Um, it's just, it's so bad. And again, I don't think there's anything they can do to make it better. This isn't really against them. Um, the owners or anything or the, the arena, I I just think the way it was designed was poor and now they're just kind of living with the ramifications of that. I don't think there is a way to fix. They almost need like a back door. So there's another way to get in. And just even like, it just, I don't know. Again, it's just how it was built. But, like, everybody gets shoved to the middle, but then those lines can't be deep at all. Um, There's the two outside lines, which are nice, and I think this year I'm going to start shifting to those, maybe, because it uh, just uh, the the hecticness of the main jam of people is very rough. But, I mean, I think allowing people into the arena a few hours early, I think would help cut that down a little bit, which would be... Much, much better, um, because that is just, and again, this isn't against them. You can't, you know, fix the entire structure of the building, but that was poorly designed, and and it's it's bad. It's rough. We're finding flaws in the arena building process in the 28 years it's been in existence. They should just take out the street (laughs) that is right next to them, bump out the uh, entire entrance, and then we're good. Um, my next one, I had a different one, but I see that you have either you or our fans that have given suggestions from the listeners. They have one down there, so I'll leave that one alone. But the, uh, the buffet, um, we've talked about it before. (laughs) It got, I think got the most amount of hate that I've ever seen, um, this year. And it's mainly because the price went way up and the quality didn't do anything. Um, I love the idea. So my brother and his family and I all go to the game together and we used to go to the buffet once a year and it was like, I don't know, our thing. And it's really great to have as an option because you're in the arena early. Like you just mentioned PK that usually you can go to the buffet, you can get to the arena early for the food and then just go sit down, eat your dinner, calm down, relax, and then just kind of very casually go to the game rather than rushing, which is what I usually do, but that's on me. Um, but it was a good time. It was fun to be in the arena early. It was fun to eat there, just relax, have dinner at the arena, and then casually walk to your seats. But now the price has gotten way out of control, especially for just what you're given. Um, it used to be, I think, 20 or 27, something like that. Um, and then it was kind of reasonable. I think for a while it was 20. I think it was 19, actually, for a really long time. I understand inflation and everything, but... For the quality not to change in the slightest, but the price to be just skyrocket. I mean, it's $35 now per person 
for that buffet, which includes salad, hot dogs, burgers, chicken fingers, pasta, and nachos, and one beer or beverage of your choice. So, I don't know. You don't get a lot. You don't get this wide variety of fantastic, amazing food. I'm not saying that they have to offer that, but for $35, that's a lot of money. Um, even if you go to a good restaurant per person, you're getting a pretty fantastic meal if you're spending $35 at, I don't know, any anywhere pretty much, I would assume, with a, a drink and pretty great food. I, I mean, for one person, it's just a lot. I understand it's in the arena, so it's that's like your advantage but i i just wish they would lower the price on that again because i do like the idea of it but there was a lot of pushback that we saw online last year due to the price and due to the quality of what you get with that price included and we did not do it last year because i just can't justify paying that amount of money for what you get um just not worth it anymore which is a shame because i i like the idea of it yeah, I also like the idea. I've never done it solely because there's just other options that is more worth my money than right. what they provide. If you want to do a, uh, an all-you-can-eat buffet, it's way cheaper than that 99% right. of the other places you go. So uh, that that I, I'm i with you. I understand inflation. Everything else is going up. I'm not trying to get into that gray area. That, I'm not opening that box whatsoever. not going to touch it. So I, I get that part of it. But if you're going to almost double the price from what it used to be, you should at least include other options. Because it, it's – from what – again, I've never done it. But from what I've heard and what you've mentioned and what other people have complained about is it's the exact same thing as it's been since the inception of it. It's just gotten more expensive. And it, they, they got to do something with it. I, I'm, I'm almost wondering if they're almost going to do away with it because at this point I don't know how many people are actually going to – go and spend $35 a person to get that type of food. Again, I, I like the idea of it, but I'm almost wondering with the renovations that are planning to come to the arena, it'll be interesting to see if they even do away with that to extend the atrium and the walkway because that, that takes up a, a big chunk of it. They could open that up and just do another meeting area for the fans out there if they just do away with the whole Lexus Club. Kind of thing. I mean, I think so. it'd be cool if they had a restaurant in there. Um, that would be a cool idea. Of yeah. some, of some idea. I mean, even like the the Bisons have uh, Petty Bones and like that right. kind of yep. idea. Like, if you had that's a, a sit down restaurant in the arena, that's the same thing, a little cheaper with better food and not a buffet, but just an actual go and sit down and eat and have a nice restaurant in the arena and then go to the game. I'd take that over what this buffet has turned into, sadly. That's very fair, and I did see a bunch of people complain about that one, so that was a good catch by you. My next one, this is more of a personal gripe that I've had since I got in my seats and I've been there for a while now. It's just titled, Ushers Keep People Back. And we sit, and again, I understand where I sit. I kind of ask for this kind of stuff. But we sit in the last possible row over the 100s, and we're on the end of that row. So the, where the people walk in and out of, it's literally to my left. Brooks right here. I'm right next to it. We got a stairwell and then take a quick left and you're out into the atrium. But we're behind where people go in to get back to their seats. Ushers need to do a better job of keeping people behind the line. And maybe that goes back to people, the, the, the painters and the people that take care of the building need to repaint a line that says stay behind this line. But either way, they walk to the very end so they can see the field. Guess what that does to me? I can't see the field. I can't count how many times I've had to ask people to move back. And by the time the third quarter starts, I'm aggravated. And I understand that the people that are on the end of my aggravation are not the same people that were doing it in the first quarter. They're the same people that were doing it in the second quarter. But guess what? I've been putting up with it for two to three quarters now. So you're going to get a little bit of an angry PK telling you to back up. So all I'm asking, and I understand not all of this is on the ushers. They can only do so much. But I, I just back up. Like, if you're going to leave your seat to get food and you're not back in time or even to the bathroom and you're not back in time to get to your seats before the play starts, have a little common decency and understand that, hey, play's going on. I need to stand here where I can still see 
you can still see from where the line is and see the field, but you wait until the play stops and then you go to your seat. That's the other thing. Go to your seats when the play stops. Like uh, it's just ushers, please, please. And we get some good ushers that are right on the point so many times, but Brooks here, I'm here. And then I got producer Pat and then we'll have a new person sitting next to us. And then our friend Mike are right here. All of their views are blocked when people just stand right in our vantage point. And then I have to be the one that goes, guys, move back. Like I think there was one Toronto people. So th this will be a fun story. They're, they're, I know I'm on a soapbox here, but this will also prove I'm not a Toronto fan. Just pointing this out there. But there was a Toronto group that were talking to the ushers for maybe five minutes. And I gave them four minutes and 59 seconds before I said anything. And I said, guys, move back. And they go, well, somebody's sitting in our seats. And I went, I don't care. Take it out in the lobby and deal with it there. I can't see what I'm paying to see. And then they did move into the uh, the back. So if you don't want to see an angry PK, and I'm turning a little bit right here, just just repaint the line. Ushers, keep everybody behind the line. And people that go to see the game have a little common decency and stay behind the line because there are people that paid to watch the game that aren't going out into the lobby to get food, bathroom, or whatever it is and stay in their seats the whole game and don't want to have their view obstructed. So that is my PK rant for the day. Uh... Yeah, stay behind the line and uh, arena staff repaint the line. Sounds like PK needs to go in the press box. <laughs> I yeah, it's it's nobody's walking in front of me there. <laughs> um, uh, this is a serious question. So I have seats where it doesn't matter. Um, I'm only blocking. Same to you. I'm all the way up against the back wall in the 117s, but uh, we have a direct staircase to our seats, so. The only people I always wait um, either way, but if I went and the play was ongoing, I'd only be blocking my family real quick, and that's it because we're all the way on the back wall and we don't have to get up because there's the the staircase right next to us. But do the ushers actually block in Bandits games you from going? I don't think they care if you go back to your seats during the middle of the play, and I think that rule needs to be a thing like at sabers games they get very upset if you try to go back before a whistle you have to wait for a whistle for an actual break and then they'll let you go but i don't think bandits games they care at all um i don't think it's the usher's fault i think it's that there's no rule for them to stop people until a whistle um so i think that needs to be changed and i always wait there's a little tv you can watch like you said, um, if it's if I didn't get back to my seat in time, it's my fault. I will casually watch the uh, the little screen TV until something happens, and then go back. There's plenty of whistles during a, a Bandits game, so um, I agree. But I think they need to make that a rule in general, right? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, it's okay. it should be just common decency, but there should be yes. the built-in rule that hey, it's. Yeah, I don't think it is one at the Bandits game. If it is, it's not enforced. Uh, right, right. The, the only time that the ushers really enforce anything is if they're lingering and I make eye contact with them that I'm getting ticked <laughs> off and the person does ask them to move. Again, there's some really good ushers that are on it. And we, we've figured out which ones they are. And when they're at the games, we're like, okay, we're, we're good until they rotate the ushers. But, you know, again, I'm not putting it fully on the ushers and I'm not putting it fully on the people. It's just everybody can do better in this situation and uh, get a, a PK that doesn't have to come on the show and rant. And uh, as president of the Buffalo Bandits and then the owner of the Buffalo Bandits, I'm uh, enforcing this rule. It's uh must abide by it now. I think you need to do what coaches and players do for uh, sports and you got to go talk to the usher pre-game get get to know them say hey i'm pk you know really get on their good side real early um just be like can you just look out for this for me and like do me a solid you got to be like super friendly with them like they are in sports with the the refs before the game actually starts like oh hey how's it going everything's great you're doing you're gonna do a great job you got to just learn all the ushers names and be just best buds I do it in soccer all the time, and any close call I always get. So I think I do have to transfer that to there. That's what I'm saying. Like, hey, I PK. My seats are back here. You know, if, if all you really want to, if if you want to do me a huge favor, and I'll slip a five ski in your pocket right. here, just exactly. uh, do me a favor and make sure that our, our line of sight isn't drawn up because a lot of people like to congregate right here. If uh, you do me a solid, I'll do you a solid. That kind of thing. I yeah, think that's I, what I you like gotta do. Idea. Yeah, I'm gonna do that next year. You're welcome. Uh, when I'm not in the press box, I'll be doing that. <laughs> 
Um, my next one, and I have no idea how to solve this one. I didn't have a great idea, but the pregame outside. Uh, I know for half the season or more, there's bad weather. So there's always so much you can do, but especially with playoffs uh, the last few years, I don't know what I want, but I know that I'm not interested usually in the pregame activities that occur. Um, and I wish I was, I guess I'll put it that way. I wish the pregame festivities that before, like well before the game starts, well before you can get in, they do, you know, sometimes that live band um, kind of hang around, maybe like a food truck. I don't know what I'm looking for, but I wish it was more enticing as a whole to get people down there. And I feel like another one, this is another one I've heard a lot of people say, like they also wish there was just more going on with it. Um, I feel like a few years ago when they did the pregame, it was a big thing for playoffs and things like that. And then they just kind of slowly faded it and it kind of exists but isn't really all that much and i don't know i wish i was just more enticed to go to the pregame because i feel like it's something i would like to do and go hang out down there and maybe get some food from some food trucks or just go hang out before the game and enjoy the nice weather if there is some um but i feel like what they have been doing recently just hasn't been all that exciting or enticing so i, I wish they would just boost the pregame well before the game outdoors if they have the good weather to do so so i'm not speaking like i know this but i'm wondering how much of that is them just not knowing what the game is going to when it's scheduled to be for the playoffs yeah. until like a week before and to me that's on the nll to get their butt in gear and schedule these things that you know i i understand that a lot of times even the nll doesn't know when the playoffs are going to be or even where they're going to be but if you can s release the the playoff schedule like hey this is when it's going to be this is the weekends it possibly could be even earlier and have the arenas not booked but prepared for that and then some of the teams can kind of line things up like okay we'll have this this and this ready to go if it happens this day we'll have this this and this lined up ready to right. go if this happens and i think a lot of it is just due to availability and short notice so i wonder if if and when the nll becomes more dominant in their own arenas if that'll help because again nll is like bottom of the barrel when they have availability in the arena so i wonder how much of that is on that but phil is there anything else you have to bring up yourself before we get into some of the suggestions from the listeners uh the only thing i had was coming up for the first listener suggestion so i'm Perfect. just gonna let the listeners take it away yeah so we had three from listeners suggested we put it out there on x few people responded and the first one here is uh something that a lot of people have mentioned for a while now is a wider range of giveaways personally i will say last year was perfect like i i think the team in previous years I was on this side of a we they got to do better for the fans and they got to do better for the season ticket holders who are paying a lot of money to continue to help this team. But I mean in previous years it was it was a team pitcher, it was badly made towels, like the the toilet paper towels. It was the pom-poms that you got every single week. It was just the same thing on repeat. But I I don't think they could have done any better than they did last year. I thought the banner was unbelievable both sides the detail that went into that the quality that went into that the the rings for the season ticket holders last year i know there was a bunch of people that were complaining hey we couldn't get it with the whole group now you understand split up your season tickets and you get more options you get more options with the 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 fan appreciation i should have been doing that all to begin with but I, even towels at the end it was very well made towels towards the, the i believe the finals as well so if they continue with that i love it if they revert back to what they were doing previous years, where it was just the the again the the single ply toilet paper paper to, or the the towels, the the only thing really that they were missing was t-shirts, and they haven't done t-shirts in a while. I remember the tuxedo one; it's a party one. They haven't really done that since COVID, and I think That's a lot of fair. that maybe a lot of that is to do with there's just so many different size shirts you need for the fans out there that a towel that's one for all, like a, a ring that's one for all. So I think they went away from that because of that option. But you know what bandits have going for them is the fan base. So they really don't have to do those big time giveaways like other teams do to get fans in the door. So 
while it would be nice to have bobblehead giveaways and better enticing things for six season ticket holders, Bandit fans kind of did this to themselves by doing too great of being, you know, Bandit Land because you don't have to trick or entice them to come to the games because the product on the field is already going to do that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, this is the one I was going to add on to, but for all the same reasons you just said, they don't really have to do too much. Um, I do think last year was much, much better. And even when we were thinking about doing this kind of episode, um, I was kind of thinking of, you know, what were things they could improve on. But last year, I think they improved on a lot of them. And yeah, this was one of the things they improved on was the giveaways and the banner, like you mentioned, was much better than we thought it was going to be. The ring didn't need to happen at all and was really cool to see. Even some of the, I know you had to pay for them, but some of the like ornaments that were signed and the little t-shirt jersey um, on the, the mini hanger, I thought that was adorable and I got one of those and that was signed and nice. Um, the only thing that I would like to see, which again, the, the, the issue is that they don't need to do this because they have so many returning fans. Um, and realistically as a organization, and if we were the presidents, I understand why they don't do it because it would literally just be them spending money and not getting anything in return, um, would be something in the off season for new season ticket holders or returning season ticket holders, just some kind of heading into the new year gift or summer gift, some kind of like, hey, thanks for getting your ticket again. Here's something. Um, or if you're a new season ticket holder, hey, thanks for being a season ticket holder. Here's this. Um, just something small. It doesn't have to be something crazy. Um, that's the only thing I would really like to see. I thought in season they did a really good job last year. But I think the, I don't know, just the renewal of season tickets and the new season ticket dollars being rewarded with that for something headed into the new year would be nice, especially when, like you mentioned, and it's it's other organizations do it because they need to get people in. And if they can entice them with a new cooler and a T-shirt and a few other like pieces of the memorabilia of the team, that might entice them. Like, oh, that's kind of cool, plus a season ticket, you know, not that expensive, that's a good time. So the bandits don't really need to do that because they already have all those fans, but it would be nice to get some kind of thanks for renewing your season ticket or thanks for being a season ticket holder or something. That's really all I would want added, um, but I don't see them ever doing that because I don't think they need to from their end. So a bummer, but I think they did much, much better last year than they had previous years. Yeah, I think last year and even a little bit the year before where you know, when we first started this this show in this company we were ragging on the social media sites and the social media team a ton and you know i think they've come a long way they've come a long way with recognizing players milestones and we talked a lot of this last year where you know our show was trying to bring to light some of the big time milestones that were happening for some of these players because the team wasn't doing it i thought the past two years they've done that and they've done that in the game as well they've taken times to point <coughs> that out and just say hey that so-and-so did this and this milestone happened just now and giving those players their quote-unquote flowers and i'm talking like uh i i know what i'm talking about here with the the saying of flowers now i just learned that the other day woo me but uh yeah i i think they've they're they're improving in a lot of areas and i will give them credit like we will bash them when we want and when they need it and we will give them credit when they need it and i thought last year with the giveaways and even the social media teams i thought they were doing a much much better job and i thought the giveaways last year were almost perfect like i i, I really do i think it was almost perfect another suggestion from a listener varying ha entertainment at halftime most times it's it's youth lacrosse and with how active the team in the community the team is in the community it makes complete sense and i think it kind of goes back to the giveaways where the rush had mutton busting this year they had joey chestnut in a in a eating contest and you even participated in one of the wing eating contests this year we won't get into that but uh I, I, they do that to draw in fans. Like they, they advertise, hey, there's mutton busting on the field at halftime. Come watch this. There's Joey Chestnut, one of the best time, best and is the best all time eating challenger. Or I don't even want to know what you want to call him in the world history. He's going to be at our halftime. Come watch that. They do that to draw fans in. Buffalo doesn't need to do that. And I think, again, that's a double edged sword for the Buffalo Bandits fans at Banditland because they're so good. 
Buffalo doesn't have to spend money in that area and devote attention to that area because the fan base is so great. If the team was struggling in attendance, that'd be a different story. But maybe one or two times a year, you can sprinkle in a different thing like they did the wing eating contest. I think there is enough time where you can kind of do both. And they have kind of done both with the the blindfold and that can get very dangerous on the field, but maybe different activities. But I do think youth lacrosse, while it might not be for everyone, it does draw in the next generation of either fans or players because a lot of these people who go there for the kids, they might not have never seen a Buffalo Bandits game. They might just be there, okay, our nephew is playing in, in at halftime here. Let's just go to the Bandits game and it hooks them. So it, it's and in young players that, you know, it might be a, just a youth player. He might just be eight, nine, 10 years old, but he's playing on Bandit's floor in front of Bandit land, getting the cheers and everything like that. That sticks in a, in a young kid's mind where, hey, maybe I don't end up being an NL player, but it grows the game and it grows the fan base. So I think that's a, it's another added element to even just a halftime of growing the, the sport itself. Yeah, I think. I don't know, exactly what you said, and again, it is the unfortunate double-edged sword of the Bandits do not need to go out of their way to have kind of gimmicks is, I don't know, the a, a bad word for it, but that idea, they don't need to do something at halftime that's going to bring in fans just to watch that halftime show, and hopefully they stick around for the game and like fall in love with the game as well, and I think exactly what you said. I think the youth lacrosse for the bandits organization is the better way to get long-term fans in there. And I think what you said as well is interesting that it's not just the players and their parents. It could be, that's my niece. That's my nephew. That's, you know, my cousin that's going to go play on the field. I think it's probably a pretty exciting thing for the families. So I think having extended family there and again going to their first bandits game they might be like oh this is actually really great and fun and i'm gonna go again and again and again even if little jimmy's not around and he's not at the at the game but um i think it'd be fun if they did something more i don't don't know organized or something just more intense like you said like a jimmy chestnut i don't know what i'm looking for at all i have no examples off the top of my head but something just professional i think is the word i was looking for like i don't know the some kind of harlem globetrotters of lacrosse comes in at halftime whatever that would i don't think that exists but that idea um and not every single time but maybe like once uh once a year fan appreciation night or something like that do something a little bit bigger a little bit more for the fans specifically um other than that i i agree i'm i don't sit there and i'm not like wildly entertained it's it's fun to watch the youth lacrosse i'm not you know i'm sure there's other things i'd rather watch but at the same time i do think it's good for the future generations to get in there and experience that and i think that sticks with a young lacrosse player for a really really long time so i mean i still remember i played at bison stadium for some championship in baseball and i got to play and pitch on the mound i hated it if we're being honest the mound was not anything like I'd experienced before, and I was terrible. I uh, did not like the mount, but um, but it was it was a interesting experience being able to pitch there and play there, and it's something that I will remember not liking forever. <laughs> yeah, even with my basketball days, uh, it's a, it's a much smaller level than even AAA baseball was. Uh, I played at Buff State for uh, the uh, sectional finals, and that's a big arena and big stadium. More better it's bigger than we're used to so again it's it like you said it's it's in the minds of the young players that are on the field and it grows a another fan base in another direction and with again how involved they are in the community and how dedicated the the franchise is to growing the sport and developing the sport at a a youth level it makes complete sense why they're doing this at halftime as well but the last one here and we're already over an hour and we already said this was going to be a shorter one is uh more of a bandits embedded and I love this idea because it's similar. It would be similar to what the uh, the Sabers and the Bills already do. It's more of a behind the scenes, maybe through training camp, maybe through the season, maybe through the playoffs. So you wouldn't get it this coming year, but they they would they would be recording it all through this year, and then next off season you have content, you have material, and it's not just you know Dane Smith, Josh Byrne, Ian McKay, and the same old players. It's hey. 
it's kind of like hard knocks. You fall in love with these type of players and you follow them along their journey. Are they going to make the team? You can follow them through training camp. So it would be behind the scenes with the players. It's more content. You can watch them in meetings. You can watch them in you know, their off season. If they're in the community there, you can tape them there, so on and so forth. But it's just, it's getting players personalities out there. It's growing the fan base in Buffalo because Buffalo has a very dedicated fan base in Bannett land. But you can expand that and grow to the to the whole community itself. That hey, yes, we know this Bandits team, but you know, once you start falling in love with the players' personalities, you latch on to the team itself, and you become a bigger fan of the sport. So I, I think an embedded Bandits would be a, a fun project. If they've had some behind the scenes stuff already, like the um, the what was it two years ago, the the championship. Uh, video that they uh, released where the Buffalo is trying to redeem themselves and earn a banner for bandit land. I believe it was called that they yeah. added uh, something Not along that, but like a whole season long, kind of like a hard knocks type thing. Yeah. I absolutely love that kind of Agreed. content. Um, I love hard knocks. I loved watching the giants off season. It was great. One that they just had. What? It was great. I loved it. Yeah. I loved all the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, that stuff is fantastic, and exactly what you just said is that I think it does bring you closer to the players, it brings you closer to the team, and it just it's not just the behind-the-scenes closer in that way of, oh, what do they get to do and kind of things like that, but I think it really attaches you to the team and the players that much more, seeing all the hard work they do and just getting to go to those you know little meetings that they have and strategy sessions and practices and what they're doing. I think all that kind of stuff is extremely interesting. And even if they didn't do it every year, because that'd be a lot for an organization like this, but if they did it one off season and even like hard knocks, this is the first time I believe that they did an off season one with the giants. Um, Most times it's in season. So maybe one year they do, you know, a training camp one year they do in the season, one year they do playoffs, one year they do, um off season behind the scenes like you can keep mixing it up and keep kind of adding to it and then kind of repeat the process and just kind of keep having those fun videos like you said they already do it for the sabers they already do it for the bills why not do it for the bandits like clearly the organization has the structure to accomplish this um and it'd be great to see them actually do i think the toronto rock already do this they do um in season yep yep so Again, I mean, another NLL team is already doing it. So they with had, an organization uh, the San Diego one uh, a few years ago, yep. it was on HBO, I think it was. That yes. one was great too. And even that, like, I mean, that's more of a, a league wide thing that they would right. need to do. But if they could find a way to get someone to do a hard knocks for a different team every single year, I think that great. would be yep. amazing. Um, but that's more league wide and that's on the the top nll execs get on that that'd be fantastic doesn't have to be the bandits i will follow anybody that'd be a good time um but i mean the fact that a team like toronto already does it and i mean it's no offense to them but i would imagine they're a little bit smaller than the bandits are at this point with the bandits being attached to the sabers and just everything the bandits are doing right now and the way they're growing like i still think I don't know. It's hard to see any organization right now being bigger than the Bandits in the NLL. Um, so if other teams can do it, the Bandits should have a way to do the same thing. So clearly they should have the resources to do something like this. I think it'd be really, really great to see because all of that kind of interaction and behind the scenes of a season is really entertaining. And like you said, I think it draws you in. And I think if they were able to find a way to release it more to the masses, that's another thing that if you're not a Bandits fan, but you go and watch something like this just because you're interested in sports, you want to see what a behind-the-scenes is like for the Bandits, and then you, like you just mentioned, get attached to those players, you get attached to that team. Even if you're not a Bandits fan, you might become one because of something like that without having to go to a game. So another way they can bring fans in, but also just a really cool experience if they could ever get that together. So that wraps up us as the Buffalo Bandits owner slash president of uh, this episode. Uh, next week will be uh, the commissioner <laughs> right? of the league for a day. So, Phil, is there anything else to this episode before we shut it down for another week? I think the only bonus one I had that I came up with as we were going through things. Um, I wish theme nights were a little better. I feel like, I don't know. I don't. I've, I, there's so many that are locked down. But I feel like last year they kind of just – toss them out there and they, they were kind of weak 
Um, I thought the I like the Office night. I think they just did such a. I, I know we're both huge fans of the Office, obviously, so that kind of has a big part of it. But the shirt that went with it, the clips that went with it, like. I think they went all in on some theme nights and other theme nights. They're like, Hey, it's Hawaii night. We're going to do the wave once throughout the game. And, uh, I don't know where, where something Hawaiian themed good to go have fun. Um, I don't know. Like there's so many locked in games that are every single year, but some of the random ones, I wish they would put a little bit more effort back into. It seemed like they kind of phoned it in last year. I do agree with that. Yep. I, I agree. I agree. I got nothing else to say. Uh, yeah, on our next episode, next Wednesday, we will talk Bills versus Steelers. We will talk anything Sabres related. We'll likely have another Man Many Minute because uh, he just wants to keep racking up these uh, these things. I, I don't do blame for him. him. I don't blame and, him. Uh, I don't blame him either. This was a stupid idea by me. It <laughs> backfired in my face. Big you started time, it too early. <laughs> most of these things do backfire in my face. And then we'll uh, be the commissioner of the NLL one more time, it was a big hit last year, so we'll do it this year. If you have any suggestions, reach out to us because, like we've done the last two weeks, we will put it on the show and we'll talk about it. So that pretty much wraps up this episode. We got a big uh, draft this coming up week. We got our keepers locked in. Uh, the uh, my brother did a great job by getting a cameo from one of the stars of the league, and uh, he ran off the keepers for us. I'm getting my uh, going for number three, Phil. I'm going to add another Get out of here. little plaque Boo. to that one. But, uh, yeah, that will add this episode. Thank you all for listening to another episode of the Buffalo Sports Collective. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at Buffalo Sports Collective, and on X and Blue Sky at Buffalo Sports Co. Visit our website at buffalosportscollective.com. You can check out our store on our link tree, on our socials, or at the shop tab on our website. You can follow our channel wherever you listen to podcasts, and make sure you leave us a review on Apple and Spotify. Until next week, bye-bye.